Dr. Gary Halkaitis, Professor of Applied Psychology, Public Health, and Medicine, and Director of the Center for Health, Identity, Behavior, and Prevention Studies. And he's also the Associate Dean at New York University, so he's uh, pretty busy. Uh, the fact that he's come up with that kind of uh, dance card is impressive to me. He's also an affiliate of the Center for AIDS Research and Center for Drug Use and HIV Research at NYU. Um, he's highly recognized for the work that he's been doing that examines the intersection between the HIV, drug abuse, and mental health issues in the LGBT population. And he is well known as one of the nation's leading experts on substance abuse and HIV behavioral research. He's the lead editor of two volumes, one of which is called HIV Plus Sex, The Psychological and Interpersonal Dynamics of HIV Seropositive Gay and Bisexual Men's Relationships. His book, Meta Amphetamine Addiction, Biological Foundations, Psychological Factors, and Social Consequences was recently published in 2009, and he's currently, or so he claims, um, at work um, on uh, another book, a new manuscript examining the experiences of gay men who are long-term survivors of HIV AIDS. Um, I could go on, I think I've probably said pretty much what I'd want to say. But he has an extensive uh, bibliography of published work in, in, in these areas, and he's been involved in a number of APA and CDC and other national committees because of the expertise and research that he's been doing. My purpose here was sort of give you a sense of the kind of work that we've been doing down at my center, sort of the portfolio of work that we've been developing over the last several years, and also give you a sense of the kind of work we do at, generally do at the center. And I, I want to point out my colleague, Farzana Kapadia, who's sitting two over from John, who is the co-director of the Center in Ships. So I'm going I'm to start by giving you a little bit of an overview of what the Center does, and then talk about two current studies, informed primarily by syndemic theory, which is the, the theory that's been guiding our work for the last several years. So um, the Center um, is a center that is a behavioral science research center. It is primarily a training ground for students. Um, essentially, if I were to summarize the work that we do at the Center, the theme that cuts through everything it is the interaction of risk-taking behaviors and substance use and mental health burden, primarily in sexual minority, but not entirely in sexual minority populations. So we're interested particularly in looking at the synergies that exist between HIV and substance use and mental health, examining biological and social factors that are drivers of risk states, understanding the meaning of being an HIV positive person versus an HIV negative person, and looking at all of these factors in relation to to a bunch of other um, conditions, including gender and sexual orientation and developmental stage. And you're going to see today, I'm going to talk about two sets of studies, one of really young gay guys and one of older HIV positive men. And so the, our work tends to go along the entire spectrum. And one of the things that we're completely dedicated to in, in working on at the center is looking at the translation of work of the work that we do to practice. So like good academics, we're always publishing. But at the same time, we always try as much as possible to translate the work for the lay, for the lay, for lay audiences. We, last couple of years, have been writing op-ed op pieces, what I like to call them our Carrie Bradshaw pieces, for a Chelsea Now, which is a local area paper. We basically just take turns talking about the findings and the work that we're seeing and the work that we're doing and what it means for real people in real life, because that's what we're doing at the center, trying to understand how to make people's lives better who are at risk for HIV, who are at risk for substance use disorders, who are, who are struggling with mental health disorders. Um, and as I said, it's a training ground. So we have a variety of different training, training um, mechanisms, all of which bring students, highly able students, to our center. But it's a very interesting pipeline. You sort of come in, you're an intern, and then we sort of test you out for a while, and we like you, and you do good work. You eventually become a research assistant, and then eventually become a project director. And I think one of our most successful stories is the story of Dan Sikanolfi, who just, who came to us at 18 years old, was an intern, and then was an RA, and then became a project director, and a month ago went off to Hopkins to do his PhD in, in epidemiology. So that, to me, is exactly what we're trying to do here, just put out the next generation of scholars doing really effective work. Um, so the first set of studies I'm going to talk to you about, the first study in particular, is a study of endemics in HIV-positive men. And so as we know, the population of HIV-positive people in this country is aging. By 2015 in the United States, all of all those who are living with HIV, 
50% will be ages 50 and older, right? So to somebody like me, and this is what I'm thinking a lot about as I'm writing this book, who was in the midst of watching all of the devastation of the early 1980s and early 1990s, it is remarkable that we now have a generation that's survived that period and is actually transitioning into their, later, their middle age and into their later stages of life, which is fraught with, you might imagine, numerous complications, which I will I'll touch on a little bit today. But we know that the, the significant portion of these individuals who are aging and are HIV positive are gay, bisexual, and other MSM. You, I'm going to use that awkward term, gay, bisexual, and other MSM, because I don't want to use the term just MSM, because I think it undermines the, the importance of sexual identity in doing this kind of work, right? So I am a gay man. I am not. I am. An, I have sex with men, but I am a gay man. And that part of my identity is really critical to understanding how I behave and what I navigate and how I make sense of my world. So I constantly have this, like all of our titles of our papers have this clunky gay bisexual mother MSM, but I, if anybody has a better suggestion on how to handle that, let us, let us know. So um, what's interesting also in this population of aging HIV positive gay and bisexual men are those who are long-term survivors. And in my mind, those are people who were infected prior to 1996. And these are the men who I'm talking with in the course of the book, whose stories I'm going to tell. And then re the recent serial converts, those men who serial convert later in life, in their late 30s or in their 40s, who are approaching their 50s at this point in time. So this pattern is true in the United States, and it's true in New York City. And there are a variety of different reasons why this is happening, probably the most important factor being the long-term long -term survival due to antiretroviral therapy. We know 1996, many of you are too young, but 1996 changed the game for HIV in this country. In this country. And prior to that, people were, were, were dying. There's a section of the book that I call, I knew I was going to do this, there's a section of the book that I call The Myth of Two, because every man that I spoke with for these life history interviews kept talking, saying to me, I thought I would be dead in two years, two years, two years, two years. And I tried to debunk that myth and talk about where it came from and why these guys who were expecting to be dead in two years are still here with us today. But obviously, antiretroviral therapy, what we used to call heart, changed the game in 1996. We also have this serial inversion that's going on in later stages of life. And you know, there's this aging baby boomer generation, of which I am part of that is becoming a very significant part of our population. And part of that population is our gay men, and part of that population are positive gay men. So um, what do we know about the physical manifestations of living with HIV as you get older? We know that the aging process is potentially accelerated. There is chronic inflammation and in the absence of effective treatments. There are neurological abnormalities. There are heightened risks for cancers, and from a psychological perspective, heightened levels of depression. Gay men in general have higher levels of depression. HIV positive men have high, heightened levels of depression. The heightened risk for cancers is really interesting and really manifesting. Stephen Goldstone is a remarkable uh, physician in this country who, who's doing, who's down on 23rd Street doing remarkable work with anal cancer. And just the incidence of anal cancer in HIV positive men is something that, and gay men in general, is something that is, 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 a, is an area of, of great concern at this point in time. We've been so busy trying to keep people's viral load down and their CD4 counts up, that we forgot that there's all these other things that could happen to them. And so we're starting to see these manifestations, particularly as men are starting to age. But we would normally see things, right? I'll be 50 next year. I know my body's not the same as it was 10 years ago or 20 years ago. And so you can imagine if somebody was living with HIV for 20 years and is also aging, the potential for physiological manifestations of abnormalities of all sorts is particularly heightened. We also know that it's more than about medical complications, that there's risk-taking behaviors. And we've documented, and a bunch of other folks have documented, ongoing illicit substance use and unprotected sexual behavior in men over age 50, right? Just because you're 50 doesn't mean you stop having sex, right? Um, and this is also true among gay and bisexual men who are HIV positive. And so this led me to write this in an article recently. For HIV positive men, 50 is the new 40 and the new 60. And it's the new 40 because, you know, you know, it's a different time. You know, when you're 50 now, you look, you still look pretty great, right? Say I do. But, <laughs> but at the same time, if you're HIV positive man, you've been living with this chronic inflammation for a good part of your life, your body looks like that of a 60-year-old. And so it's not uncommon to find physicians prescribing to men who are in their 40s, late 30s, medications that are normally um, set aside for people as they get older for the treatment of high blood pressure and cholesterol and what have you as protective against these symptoms and these diseases that will manifest in HIV positive men, 
potentially at a much higher rate. And so what we wanted to do in this study was sort of try to look at and take this theory of syndemics, which I love, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to own that, and try to take it and apply it to a population that had never been applied before to, which is that of H older HIV positive men. And we wanted to see whether or not the syndemic manifested in a way similar to, to, to that of younger men. Now, for those of you who don't know, this is a theory that was first developed by Merrill Singer, who was an anthropologist at the University of Connecticut. It is a, a theory that basically argues that if you show me, that basically says that, there, that when we think about health of people in this country, that when we're thinking about the HIV epidemic, we cannot think about the HIV epidemic separate from, from, from issues of substance use and mental health. That these are mutually enforcing epidemics, that they exacerbate each other. And so he coined the term syndemic, right? So that this is a multitude of epidemics, not existing in isolation, but existing in relation to each other and potentially fueling each other. Um, show me substance use, I'll show you sexual risk taking. Show me mental health burden, I'll show you substance use. These things don't happen like in boxes separate from each other. And the other thing that's really a beautiful element of this, of this particular theory that, that Merrill took, took and wrote about was the notion that people who are experiencing more psychosocial vulnerabilities in our society, those who are facing discrimination, homophobia, who have less access to services, those individuals are particularly more susceptible to the development of syndemics than those who have access and are not facing those, those situations. And so Merrill applied that to study the HIV epidemic in Latinas in New York City and other urban areas. And then in the early 2000s, Ron Stahl, who was at the University of Pittsburgh, took the theory and started to apply it to um, studies of, of, of gay men. And lo and behold, the theory. It's just one of those theories that just sort of makes sense. Sort of like, like I always felt about trans theoretical stages of change theory. It's just logical and makes sense. That's how people operate. This is what I love about this theory. Right? It doesn't have a bunch of arrows going in certain directions, but it basically says higher, more, more burdens, more health problems. Health problems are not isolated. And so we wanted to study whether or not this syndemic manifested in this population, and we did a project called Project Gold that I thought stood for gay older dudes, but every time I said that to my team, they just laughed at me. Yeah. Gold for 50, let's go for that, right? So this was our study, and it was funded by a pilot grant. Um, and so we did the study in two phases. Phase one, 100 men, and phase two, another 100 men. In both phases, we did quantitative surveys to try to manifest the syndemic in a mathematical way. In the first phase, we also did qualitative interviews using the listening guide. The listening guide is a method used developed by Carol Gilligan, Famous psychologist told us that girls learn better in schools when they're not the boys. Anyway, it's a psychoanalytically informed qualitative methodology. Everybody at Ships has drank this Kool-Aid. We're all on board with this theory. We apply this theory. We believe it. Sometimes we hate it. Mostly we love it. Anyway. And then in phase two, we also did quantitative surveys, but we also did STI testing because one of the things we wanted to see was whether physicians, and these guys were all in care for the most part, were adhering to the CDC recommendation about STI testing that said it's not enough just to look at genital STIs. You had to look at oral STIs, and you have to look at rectal STIs. And we wanted to know what we wanted to see if we would detect any STIs in those other areas that are not commonly tested by physicians. So that was our study. We used, um, as we always do, and we collect sexual behavior and drug use data, the timeline follow-back method, a method where we use basically a calendar and we get, gather data, contextual data for the course of a month, right? And we looked at that, we gathered that. We had a bunch of psychiatric and mental health measures, including the Beck Depression Inventory, post-traumatic stress checklist, and then, I wish I had these data shows here, a bunch of cognitive measures, because there is some belief Although it's like this, the literature about neurocognitive functioning in older HIV positive folks. Mm, is it the aging that's causing the neurocognitive deficits? Is it the HIV? Is it both of them? It's, it's, it's interesting. A paper just came out in the Journal of Health Psychology that Bruce Homer and I, Bruce Homer is at Graduate Center and I, a colleague of mine, looked at meth use and social cognitions and showed that both substance use and <coughs> HIV status had an effect on social cognition. So there's, there's reason to believe that, that, that living with HIV for a long time might have effects on neurocognitive functioning. And one of the guys in the book who you will come to know as Kerry, speaks very eloquently about his inability to remember and access information. Okay, then a bunch of health markers, health-related quality of life, an adherence measure, 
measures of diarrhea, and then assessments of diarrhea on chlamydia, self-reported CD4 and viral load counts, and a bunch of psychosocial burdens, including instrument partner violence, bereavement scales, homophobia scales, a whole bunch of things. Pilots say, right, we can do everything, right? You just sort of threw everything in there and went with it. Okay, so we uh, partnered with local community-based organizations, we screened, we ended up with a final analytic sample for this study of 199, one was a dupe, so we got rid of him, 199 men. We, we were pretty, it was really, it was so interesting about this study was that there was no problem getting men to be in the study. They were knocking on our door and kept saying, really, you want to study me, right? Like, I'm 55 and positive, why do you want to study me? And they were just, felt so empowered to be involved in a research study that was focusing totally on them. And I had the same thing when I was doing the interviews for the books. In fact, last Thursday, I had a focus group with all of the guys. I brought them together so they could meet each other. They were all there, right? Just amazed that anybody wants to tell, hear their stories. So the guys were on average 55 years old. They've been living with HIV on average for 18 years, but look at the range one, from one, a recent serial convert, to 27, right? But generally, this is a, a group that's a long-term survivor group. 70% of them had been uh, diagnosed either through an antibody test or, as was the case in the early 80s, because they developed some opportunistic infection prior to 1996. In terms of race ethnicity, this is our sample. In terms of sexual orientation, primarily gay and bisexual, but you know, the occasional straight guy and the other. Don't label me. Um, <laughs> educational attainment, not your typical San Francisco sample. Not your typical, I said that really, right? Not your typical San Francisco sample. 47% had high school or less. And I, I, I say that jokingly, but if you do look at the literature out of San Francisco, and in particular one research center, you'll see <laughs> there's a bunch of white, well educated guys in their study. And that's always our goal. We don't want just those guys. Yeah, those guys are some guys, but they're not all guys. So anyway, so here they are. Most of them currently not working. Um, almost all of them have some kind of health care coverage, right? They were, they were connected. And they went to all sorts of places, including private doctors and public clinics, some to the VA, very few, a handful only to the ER as their consistent form of care. Kind of makes sense of what these guys were all about. Now, so, we, so I wanted to look at what the burdens look like in the lives of these men. And so this is just a frequency dump, one yes, zero no, of the men who qualified as having a depression based on the cut score, PTSD, and then alcohol to intoxication poppers, inhalant nitrates, yes, make sense? Um, marijuana and other drug use in the sample. So this is the last 30 days. This is PTSD symptoms and depression are also recent. Over 20% had symptoms of depression, over 20% symptoms of PTSD. Now this is remarkable to me because if you look at the 9-11 literature, the 9-11 literature will say to you that most people who were on or around when that happened, about 15% of them will experience symptoms of PTSD. I have argued, as I have in the book, that the AIDS crisis is a terrorist attack on the gay community. And that this is why you see these rates of PTSD, certainly in men of my generation, positive or negative but continually in the gay community. Substance use, some, although, you know, this one's, you know, lots of marijuana use. This one's a little inflated, remember, because everything's in here, like meth and coke and crack and everything, so this is, number's a little elevated. And so, um, we also looked at the association, a bunch of odd ratios here, looking at the association between the drugs and all the mental health symptomatology, not surprising, an odds ratio of nine between PTSD and depression. So if you're having experiences of PTSD, you're, high, you're likely to be depressed too. And then what I did, so this is what happens in all of the endemics articles that have been published so far because it's public health orientation, and then I'm going to make fun of it in about five minutes. But basically what folks do is they, they count up each of the burdens, right, and they come up with a total score, and then they show that that total score of burdens is related to risk taking behavior. And I'm not going to be original here, I'm going to do the same thing with this particular sample because it's a pilot study. And so um, about 32% had no burdens, and by burdens I mean, remember, pot, poppers, alcohol, depression, PTSD, other drugs, less than 1% had, had five. So the question then becomes, um, what, is, what, is, what is the burden score, if I add these up, what is, how does it look like in relation to risk? Well, on average the burden score was about one. It was related to age inversely, meaning older guys had lower scores. 
and related to, to race ethnicity with black guys having higher burden scores than Latino guys, white guys, black guys tangentially more than white guys, other, always a tricky category, than Latino guys and others than white guys. The other category always makes me tense because you know what you have in there, you've got like API, you've got mixed race, it's, this, is a, this is an odd thing. I know I'm sorry for that. Um, and this is the sexual behavior of the men looking at any, any unprotected sex in the last month. So about 20% had any anal with another positive guy, either receptive or insertive, um, and about 10% any anal with a negative guy. So some kind of serial sorting going, is that an expression we know, serial sorting? There's, there's some kind of selection of character, of, of partners, it looks like based on serial status. Positive guys, it looks like the positive guys are doing behaviors and choosing partners who are positive more than they're doing it with negative guys. So then the question becomes, is, the burden score related to um, the risk behaviors. And for all but one, you get a significant odds ratio saying that those with higher burdens are more likely to engage in risk behavior. So lo and behold, this basic theory based, begun by Stoll in the 2003 article that shows more burdens, more risk, is also true for HIV positive um, gay and bisexual men. It might not seem like a huge leap, but actually in the research world, kind of a huge leap, right? Because I've applied it to a population that had never been applied to. Then we did a regression analysis, uh, a binary logistic regression analysis, where we were trying to control for years of living with HIV and race, ethnicity, and age. And while controlling for those, total current psychosocial burdens still were significant in predicting unprotected anal with positive partners and unprotected anal with negative and unknown partners. So, seems like a very powerful way to understand risk behavior in this population, that in this population too, level of burden is related to risk taking. So then we tried to di disentangle which of those factors were in there. This is actually gonna come out in, in um, Annals of Practicing Anthropology, I think somewhere in the next six months, this article, looking at what factors were key in determining this burden score, and alcohol to intoxication was a big one for this, for this particular sample of older positive men and driving the risk behaviors. And I, well, since we did the qualitative interviews, I figured I'd, I'd, I'd put a quote up there for you. This is not a detailed analysis, this is just an example of a black man, age 58, who'd been living with HIV for 16 years, but if you can see really in this man's story, it's like a powerful story of talking about losing his partner, John, and how he turned to a world of drugs as a result of, of that emotional burden, and how that world of drugs and the cycle he got into with the world of drugs led to his risk taking and eventually to his own seroconversion. And uh, this is not an uncommon story that I've heard from men of my generation. Uh, we also caught, as I said, sort of a little afterthought here, we also caught four cases of STIs two cases of rectal chlamydia and two cases of penile chlamydia. Shocking here, because it made me think that, wow, maybe they're not all testing, maybe they're just all testing for gonorrhea and syphilis and not testing for chlamydia on, on the penis here. But uh, with Rafael Perez Figueroa, who is my postdoc, is working on an analysis of this. 4% is big for guys who are in care every three months and are supposedly getting, you know, the best kit, well, assuming really good care. We think they're getting, we, we wrote a grant last, last Winter mm -hmm. in 1892, somewhere. I mean, we wrote a grant last winter, uh, and it was a study of older gay men. And one of our hypotheses was that the positive guys would actually have better health markers in some ways than the negative guys because they were constantly in care. So it was surprising to me that we got four cases of, of STIs. So, in conclusion, um, from this particular study, there's a high level of uh, psychosocial burdens and association with the psychosocial burdens with unprotected sex. So there's initial support for the applicability of the theory, and there's clear evidence here of the mutually reinforcing nature of drug use, psychiatric disorders, and unprotected sex. It doesn't stop at 35 kids, right? It keeps going. These guys are 55 years old, right? It's still going on for them. Implications and translation, um, just gonna leave you with some thoughts on this, is that this generation of men, I think they're fascinating. I'm calling them, the, the book is called The Age Generation, and I'm disentangling this generation and from the generation before them. I'm talking about guys who were in their late teens, 20s, in the 1980s. <clears throat> so when I was at Columbia at 18 in 1981, at 19 and 1982, at 20, and every, it was hitting the fan everywhere, 
right? That's the guys I'm talking about, the guys who are in the midst of it while they were going on. This is a very unique experience for these guys. This is a group of men who lived through something that future generations of gay men, while certainly devastated by HIV, continue to be devastated by HIV, didn't live through this experience of loss that happened for this generation. So there's something really remarkable about, about hearing these stories. So um, yeah, that's a little article we wrote. I don't know, I have it there. And um, as I said, you know, I think that what, what is really interesting to me in doing this work is that I think we don't even know what the needs of baby boomers in general are. Folks who are like 50 to 65 in this country, I think that community-based organizations and uh, service delivery places for older folks are struggling with what the generation, this generation, my generation, is going to want from them. And so we, we're, we're grappling with that. We know even letter, l less about the needs of gay and other MSM who are baby boomers. And within that, the group of HIV positive MSM are particularly uh, specific. And I think we're only scratching the surface on their particular needs. So look forward to the book next year. It's going to be great. Um, so P18 is now another study that I want to talk about. And this is a study of syndemics. And this is a study of younger men, of younger HIV negative men. So we know in the United States, when you look at seroprevalence rates and incidence rates of HIV, you see the highest rates of infection among gay and bisexual men, right? Doesn't mean that everybody's not affected by HIV. Let's be clear, right? But let's be realistic. In this country, probably 2 to 7% of, of, of the population are gay men, maybe 10. Depends which article you're reading, Chandra et al., it depends, right? Let's go with 10. Let's go upper limit. But gay men are 50-something percent of new infections, of AIDS, AIDS diagnoses, of ongoing infections. That is a, to talk about a health disparity, that's an enormous, enormous health disparity, right? So in this group, and in particular, as, you, as I'm sure many of you know, in the last decade, the issue has been particularly around young men, ages 13 to 29, particularly young men who are Latino and African American men who are at highest risk for mm -hmm. HIV, right? And you see these rates just going up in New York City over the last decade, right? And black, black youth are most at, most at risk, you know, and you look at, you know, my, I'm looking at my colleague Rafael here, like with incidence of HIV in this population escalating for Latino and black men. And not just going on in New York City, but going on in major metropolitan areas. What I actually think is really interesting, and I have some hypotheses about this, is that you see rates of infection for young white, for young black and Latino men, 13 to 29, and then the white guys hit after 30. And I have, I think I know what's going on. I'll come back to that later. <laughs> so the trends parallel what's going on in other cities. Um, so we did an initial study, thanks to Rafael and his colleagues, got some funding from the, from the city. The city funded us to do a small pilot study um, of, and looking at sexual behaviors of 13 to 29 year olds. Needless to say, gathering sex and substance use behavior on the 13 to 17 year olds was a struggle with our IRB, but we did it. <laughs> and we have, we've got data on them. But what you see here is one of the questions we asked was age at first sex with another man. And you do see some drift differences here. You know, the black men younger than the API men, the Latino men younger than the white men, the Latino men younger than the API men. So if you play the probability game and you start sex earlier, then the probability of getting infected or contracting the virus also increases because you've expanded the period of time where you're at risk for the virus, right? It's compared to waiting until you're 40 or 50 to have sex, okay? We also look at age at first sex of receptive anal intercourse, and again, similar patterns here. Both the black and Latino <coughs> men reported a younger age than the white men and the other men in the sample. They're starting earlier, and they're starting receptive anal intercourse earlier, right? So if you start those behaviors earlier, you're more likely to become HIV positive earlier. Um, what was interesting to me in this analysis also, and this is just background, is that I, I asked the men again, timeline follow-back method that we use, who they were choosing as their partners, and there was a lot of concordance between race and ethnicity. So white guys were choosing white guys, and black guys were choosing black guys, and the only guys who weren't really choosing somebody of the same race, ethnicity, were Asian Pacific Islander guys, right? But there was not only, so this notion that we have in the HIV literature of zero sorting by HIV status, there's also this like racial ethnic sorting that's going on too, which I think is part of the explanation for what's going on with the HIV epidemic in young black men in this country. 
So Project 18, with this Hadi Patati here, um, was a project, it's called Project 18 because to be in the study you had to be 18. It's also probably our 18th project, we think. We're not 100% sure, but we're gonna go with it is. Right, so we called it Project 18. And we did all these really, really interesting ways of recruiting these guys, with these like bar scans and Facebook accounts and like social networking. It was amazing how we got these guys. But we ended up getting our sample and the goal here was to test the theory of syndemics, but to take the theory to a better level, to take it to a place where psychologists would take it. <laughs> All of the work on syndemics that thus far had been done by, by public health people with their odds ratios and stuff like that, and that's lovely, and that's part of my identity, but I wanted to do something more with this theory. So we wanted to look at this theory in this more complex uh, statistical way, and we wanted to do something else that nobody had really done, which is follow the men into their young adulthood, right? Why are we asking men at 30 what went on at 18? Why are we taking 18 year olds and following them and seeing what happens over time, right? So that's the study we're doing right now. We're in the midst of it still. Perspective, perspe perspective cohort design, seven waves of data collection, baseline in every six months. We're applying for a competitive continuation. My goal in my life is to take this group till they're 40, and then I'm done. Then I can retire and go to the beach house and I'll be good to go. But if I can, these guys are almost 21 now, so that means 19 more years I'm, I'm committing to. <laughs> um, it, it would be nice to have data on, you know, you know the MAX cohort? You guys know the MAX, the multi-center multi AIDS cohort study? It's a study of, that's been following them since the 80s. Okay, they're interesting, right? They're not these guys, right? They're guys in my generation. And these guys are different from guys in my generation. Okay, so ages 18, could have been just 19 at baseline, having sex with a male partner, did not have to identify as gay or bi, just said, you know, I had sex with a guy in the last six months, right? Because we know at 18, things are fluid, right? <laughs> or in life. Um, uh, we used active social media strategies, the internet, gay identified events, college campuses, we did everything to get the sample. And remember, you have to be like 18, right? So you couldn't be like 22, and you couldn't be 17. In the last six months, we made it like, if you had just turned 19 like a few weeks before we let you in, right? But that's a very specific criterion for recruitment to the study. And we wanted to extend the theory of syndemics, and let me keep going. So we, uh, we, we the, the, the first thing we really wanted to do was really say, look, we want to take this theory, and we want to show it, we want to show that it's true using latent construct modeling. We want to use a more sophisticated methodology to show that the theory of syndemics upholds. And so we, I, I'm going to show you just briefly this analysis. This paper just came out in AIDS and Behavior. It's EPUB ahead of print. It's out there. Measured demographics, unprotected sex, substance use, and mental health burden. Okay. Unprotected sex using the timeline follow-back method again. And if you haven't used this method, this is a great method. This is a really great method. You sit there and you fill out a calendar. Right, so I sit there and I say, what month is it? September. Well, let's say, well, let's circle the special holidays. Well, it was Yom Kippur and, and Rosh Hashanah and it was Labor Day. And you start from those days that are, live more active in the memory of most people, those special events, birthdays, anniversaries. And then you fill out the calendar from there. And you ask what happens on every day. So at the end of it, I can give you a whole calendar on what's, who had sex on what day with what type of guy and where he met him and what drugs they were doing, and where they had sex, and what color their sweaters were. I mean, it's basically all there. But we took that data. And then we had this series of mental health, bur mental health burdens, and then again, our substance use data. So here's our sample for this study. Very good job here. You see, only 28% of the sample is white. This is mostly um, ethnic and racial minority men, and also 38% Hispanic, regardless of race, 15% uh, black close to 10% mixed race, about 5% Asian. In terms of confirmed HIV status, so you came in at base and so we test these guys for HIV each time, right? So you can imagine, like at our research center, like, you know, I'm always looking at my phone because I get, like, you know, research 911 text, which means that somebody's zero, zero converted, so everybody needs to be on alert. Because sometimes the reactions are okay, and sometimes they are really not okay, and most of them are somewhere in between. Anyway, so um, we caught six unexpected positives at baseline. 
and I, I, I will show you in a second what's happened over the course of the year with positivity. Um, most of the men were enrolled in some form of school. Most of them were born in the U.S., although not totally. And then look at sexual orientation. We're using the Kinsey scale here. I made a cut. So if you said six on the Kinsey scale, you were exclusively homosexual. And if you didn't, you were not. And um, I don't love these charts, but I'm putting them up anyway. Here's their substance use. Not a lot of substance use. Um, in this in this in this age group, right? So this notion that meth, methamphetamine is the source of all problems in the gay community is not really real. But if they are using any drugs, it's alcohol to intoxication, marijuana, inhalant nitrates, and some ecstasy use. And here is their mental health spread. I'm not going to go on that. Um, and this is their sexual behavior. And like the previous study, there is some risk-taking behavior, but not a lot, right? There 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 there's there's some. There's some behavior, mostly oral, right? Some unprotected anal, but mostly oral. Okay. So the first thing we wanted to do is we wanted to build these. So with what, what structural equation modeling, what you do is you have these, these manifest variables, these variables that you measure, and you see whether they correlate with each other and create a mega construct. And so what we wanted to do is for all the indicators of mental health, and all the indicators of substance use, and all the indicators of sexual, unprotected sexual behavior, we wanted to see if the variables stuck together and created a construct. And then we wanted to see whether we could create a super mega construct, a second order construct, that we're going to call the syndemic. And so with the first one, we found a high level of association, setting suicidal thoughts as one, between depression, loneliness, and PTSD. So these things were gluing very nicely together. With drugs, same thing. Marijuana, poppers, days of drug use. We also did urine samples too. Basically telling us if you're using one drug, you're using more. if you're using one drug, you're using other drugs. And last but not least, episodes of unprotected sex, uh, receptive anal, performing oral sex, these were also uh, highly related. We also put confirmed HIV status in the model that didn't work out, but that's because there were only six guys at baseline who actually ended up being positive. But lo and behold, when we put it all together, it really worked. And what we were able to show in this model, which again is an AIDS and behavior, is the following. Not that drug use, mental health burden, and unprotected sex create one mega construct, that we didn't find that. But what we did find is that drug use and mental health burden created a mega construct, and that that mega construct was related with unprotected sex. And when I went back to the literature and looked at the work that Stahl had done and Mustansky had done, and all those syndemic -y people and Meryl Singer. In fact, what we did show is what they showed, which is these two things go together and they precipitate this thing. And so we were able to show this in a very, very fancy schmancy statistical sort of way, which I think gives a lot more credence to the, to the, to the theory. I think we're the first people to do this. So <laughs> I'm proud of that. Okay. So now, here's what's really interesting in this data set, and I, I just have the, this is the, this is the proof again that this HIV problem in 18 to 29, or in young adult, young men, is in the Latin Latino population. So when we looked at prevalent cases of HIV, this is at baseline of this, we could detect it six guys, so keep that in mind, these, these proportions are based on six. None of them were white, and none of them were Asian. Um, about two and a quarter percent of them were black, mixed race, and this mixed race is always one partially black, okay? So there's evidence, one, that look, yes, the epidemiological data is true, we're manifesting it in this, in this sample too. What's more distressing to me is the HIV incidence, and this is the detection of new HIV cases within the course of the first year. So within the course of the first year, the incidence case for the Asians and whites is zero no new infections, because remember, they're coming back every six months to be tested. Look at the black guys, 7% incidence rate. Look at the mixed race guys, 2%. Look at the Hispanic guys, 2%. Overall, overall, it's 2% for the entire sample. The white and Asian guys below, the Latino guy, the black guys above, and the Latino and Hispanics about comparable to the, to the overall sample. So here it is, and I can tell you that now we're up to month 30, it's just perpetuating. We continue to see this. Uh, so we were able to show this uh, effective uh, model, this uh, structural equation model with the sample. 
Um, I think we were able to do it very well just to show that observable variables, behavioral variables can create, can provide proof for a theory in a very sophisticated way. Stuff we've all said before. So um, I'm going to just say that if we're so if we're if we're going to really fully address the HIV epidemic in this population, you all know this. I'm not saying anything new here. That we have to think about this in tandem with substance use policies, substance use care, substance use counseling, and mental health counseling. Right? Sex does not happen in isolation. Right? And what I'm not even bringing to the equation here is the role that policy and structure and environment play in participating risk. If you want to read a great editorial on AJPH by that Perry Halkidis guy that just came out this month, um, it's called Obama Marriage Equality and the Health of Gay Men, where I basically argue that, that that policy in the long run is going to be good for the health of gay men. And I think the role of structure and policy, this is Mark Hartson Bueller's work, do you know that name? Uh, he's awesome. We almost recruited him at NYU, but then he went to Columbia. Um, <laughs> I did this amazing work in Massachusetts where he was able to show that the mental health of LGBT folks just improved after the enactment of marriage equality in Massachusetts. It's a really great work by Mark Hartson, who was a really fantastic researcher. But, you know, we need to attend to these behavioral issues, but also within the context of the environment that we're living in. Okay. So, um, you know, we're, we're, we're in the process of disseminating this stuff. How am I doing for time? Good? Okay, so I'm just going to leave you with some final thoughts here, and then we can open it up to questions. So, um, I love this theory. I believe syndemic theory is the way to go, in both, both in terms of understanding behavior, but also in directing the formation of policies and services for, for HIV-positive individuals and HIV-negative individuals, that holistic approaches to care are the way to go. Every year, I, take a, I do a class called HIV Prevention and Counseling that I do in, in London. A shameless pitch um, <laughs> that I take students for two weeks to London and we compare um, HIV practices and policies there to their health system, the NHS, to our system, which is, I don't know what it is, some, something in transition. And um, one of the first trips we take is to the Mortimer Street Clinic, which is on Tottenham, you know, London Tottenham Court Road, right in Bloomsbury, right in the center of London there. And what's really amazing is about how integrated their service delivery is, right? So they've got a mental health person there, they've got the dentist there, they've got the psychologist. Like it's all into, like it's, they get it. There's prevention services, not just positive people, it's positive people with prevention. It's like everything is holistic. And I think that this is what this theory tells us, is that holistic approaches to care and prevention is what needs to be the, what needs to be the case. It's not about back in the day, in the 80s, wearing a condom every time, right? It's, about the meaning of sex and the meaning of sex in relation to how you feel about yourself and the meaning of sex in relation to the substances you use. These are people are people and people are complex, multifaceted beings, yet we want to sort of like just separate things out and deal with them one at a time. And that's not the way it works. I've always used, I, 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 I believe that if we're going to actually make a, make a change and have an effective change in HIV in this country, You've got to attack it. You've got to attack it not only on the um, on the on the behavioral level, but you've got to attack it on the structural level, right? You've got to attack it in multiple fronts, just the way you treat HIV, which is medications that attack the virus on multiple fronts, right? So, works for the virus should work for prevention too. But we just sort of want to do things like you know, like this linearly. We're going to give condoms, and things will get better. Well, you're going to give condoms, but people are still going around saying you're a big fat to people, and that's going to put the people at risk. Right, so that's the kind of stuff where we need to go in the future. Health is more, I think the other thing that is really critical and what we're hearing, especially from the young men we're working with, is that health is more than HIV, right? I think for like 30 years we've been directed by a healthcare delivery for gay men that's focused solely on HIV as if that's the only problem gay men face. And so wrapping HIV care within holistic care that deals with total health is the way to go. We need to consider, I mean, an HIV agenda, i.e. a sexual health agenda, needs to just be a health agenda, period. And that's where we need to go. Uh, three, we need robust theory to really guide the work that we're doing. Syndemics is a start, right? But I think it's also limited in its approach. And so, 
What, what I think we need to do is develop theories and test theories that are multi-level and dynamic, that recognize that there are multiple levels that affect people's behavior, that things change over time. The prevention services I'm given to a 19-year-old is very different from the prevention services I'm given to a 52-year-old, right? And, that, um, and then to recognize that the drivers that drive risk at one age might not be the same that drive risk at another age. So one size doesn't fit all here, is guess, I guess what I'm saying here. And that change happens over time. And so this is the beginning of a model that my colleague Farzana and I and our colleague Danielle Ompad, who's also at NYU, we still her, um, have started to put together where we really want to sort of start to begin to understand the level of individual level factors, social cohesion factors, which Farzana has a lot of expertise in, and then the role of environmental factors. That, person nested within social relationships, nested within context, and how those inform overall health and healthcare access. And more importantly, how these inform the various places along the continuum and along the levels where we can actually intervene. So that's the beginning of that. And I think finally, the thing I'm gonna leave you with here is I think that for 30 years, and I've been guilty of this, that we have focused on a deficit model. We keep saying, oh, 50% are positive, or 30% are having unsafe sex, or 22% are using meth. Well, but for the 22%, and not really 22%, it's more like 12, let's say, 12% are using meth. But for the 12% who are using meth, 88% are not using meth. And what we have done for 30 years in this epidemic is use the problematic behaviors, the, what I'm gonna call the maladaptive, that word, but maladaptive behaviors, to inform the development of services. And why I think we need to start doing is looking at the 88%, not the 47%, or whatever that line is there, the 88%, and what's asking ourselves, what are they doing right? right? And so, and I think what, what we're trying to really get out of, I just presented a slice of this very complex study with the young guys, is we're not only documenting the risk behaviors, we're also documenting the resilience. Because what we hope to get out of there then is what they are doing effectively and use that as models for working with agencies to develop services around the guys who are being resilient, that's a loosey goosey word, but are, who are showing adaptive and healthy behaviors. And I'll leave you that. Look, let's start, let, let's, not, let's keep it separate from the HIV to begin with anyway, okay? A 20 year old is different from a 50 year old, right? Let's just start with pure human development. Emotionally, you're different. Physiologically, you're different. Socially, you're different, right? I can tell you that who I am today, at almost 50, <laughs> is not who I was when I was 20. Okay, so I'm gonna start there. I'm gonna say number two, what is, for gay men in particular, and I think what we're seeing here is, we're seeing a generation that is my age, that's was devastated and a community decimated. And a, a, a group of us were just exhausted at this point from having lived with this for, the whole, for our whole lives. And what's happened is, I think that, what I heard this on Thursday in the focus group is that these men, who, there's a generation of men, I have so many thoughts, there's a generation of younger men <coughs> who are coming into their own now in their 20s and 30s might normally look to an older generation as role models. So many of us are dead, that, that, that's gone. And I would say number three, historically, it's just a different time, right? So what it meant for me to be a gay man coming out in 1981, you know, down the block here, um, was very different from my colleague Arnie Grossman, who's at, who's at NYU also, who came out, I don't know, in the 60s or something, right? So his experience is very different from my experience and my experience is very different from somebody who's coming up now. So I think there's this enormous disconnect, not only because of developmental issues and historical issues, but because the way sexual identity and the HIV epidemic is manifesting now is radically different than it was 30 years ago. There's a yeah, lot more. I wasn't trying to suggest it's only because of this one scientific yeah. finding that we can now treat HIV. I'm glad for the fuller uh, throated sort of analysis of the differences. Um, but I, I, I guess I want you to comment specifically on the question of how the psychology of preventing HIV infection has been shaped by the fact that we've got fairly effective antiviral oh, I can treatments that, that now help people to manage this yeah. as a chronic disease. And 
so this is the hot button issue right now, right? That like how to, what, what's the issue? So so we spent 30 years having behavioral interventions that kind of work. And now, as you may know, there are biomedical interventions in the form of pre-exposure prophylaxis, right? Have you heard about this mm -hmm. prep? Okay. Needless to say, this has like the APA all freaked out, right? Because because what's in, but because if and Rafael has been in these meetings with me, right? There's this there's this sense that we gotta throw out all of the behavioral stuff because now we've got the beautiful blue pill once a day and it's gonna solve the problems. And there's those of us who are sort of navigating this and saying, well, the beautiful blue pill, the Truvada, is great, but what we know about birth control and what we know about condom use and what we know about other behaviors is that people don't adhere to their, to their treatments the way they're supposed to. So you can't throw away the behavioral just in favor of the biomedical. This is gonna be a hot debate, because I think the way, pre I think PrEP's great, and I think we should do it and I think we should just give people who are at risk these pills and prevent the onset of HIV. With the notion that we also have to educate and provide the behavioral supports to do it. And if you're interested in a really interesting statement on that, um, um, one, of, and one of my other tasks in life is to be the chair of the Committee on Psychology and AIDS of the APA. We put forward a resolution last, fe last February called Biomedical Resolution around HIV, something like that. But it's a very clear statement that talks about the integration of these services. I've got to say one more thing. Look, HIV is not what it was 30 years ago. It's not. It's not a death sentence. And thank God it's not a death sentence. Doesn't mean it's not around. Doesn't mean that, it doesn't mean that a young gay man who's 18 getting infected right now just sitting there saying, oh, it's fine. Not at all. You should see the reactions in our lab. It's not fine. It's still frightening, right? But there are options now. And I think the integration, I think what had to happen in the 80s when everyone was dying and we were all just sort of like trying to like make sense of all of this, we had to focus on HIV and sex and that was it. Now I think this notion of expanding our idea of what HIV means within a concept of like total health is the way that we need to go. Yeah, I appreciate your response, thank you. So let's uh, get some other questions. Yeah. Yes. What, and you and, and we, if you tell me your over name. Over here, then we've got one here and then one here. You tell me your name and, and, and what your relationship is to this place. Yeah, Roy Sloan Martinez, second year master's in the developmental psychology program here at TC. And I have more, but I'm a, okay. okay, that's a good um, question. And I think you're right. I think it's like it's not just HIV, right? It's like, and you know, it's all this other stuff going on too. And as we all know, there's that non treatable gonorrhea going on now, which is a huge problem. There's one medication in the pipeline, and there's nothing else after that. Very bad. Oh, sorry. Uh, you mentioned uh, in terms of the racial disparities among the young gay men that one of the things that might contribute to this is the fact that they're engaging in sex earlier. I was wondering if you uh, could uh, elaborate on yep. other things that might be going on in terms of yep. chronic stress, etc. Okay, so this is my theory, this is my hypothesis, and this is, I believe other people believe this too. But I'm just going to put it out there, and, and this is also described in an article that we published in Jades last year, which is based on that data. Here's what I think is happening. I believe that young black men, let's say with black men right now, who are like 13 to 20, let's say, are having sex with other young black men, right? I believe that at that point in their lives, the concentration of virus in that segment of the population is higher than it is for the white guys, right? There's this untreated, there's this high, what's called in the high le, higher levels of viremia, right? And I think they're infecting each other. And I think what is happening is that that's leveling off eventually as these guys get older. But what ends up happening with the white guys is the viremic pool increases as they get older. They're having sex with other white guys, and that's why they're not getting infected until like later on. Did that sort of answer your question? High concentration of virus with same race partners is my explanation for why young black men are still converting at 18 and young and white men are still converting at 32. Right. I guess it's that's another part of my question though was whether or not there was differences um, um, in terms of socioeconomic levels oh, yes. within stock okay. populations of Absolutely. young black men. Um, so for my so the other thing I'm doing in my life is doing my freaking MPH because I've got nothing better to do than going back to school. <laughs> Um, yes, and for my thesis, <laughs> I actually used that data, and I did a very simple, I did a very simple, like, Lincoln-Phelan informed fundamental cause analysis, 
where I showed that when I put race and SES and foreign-born status and educational, attain, educational attainment, I think that's right, in there, the race factor goes away. It's SES, right? So lower, middle, and lower SES guys, I don't care what race you are, are more risky. So you give me a white low SES guy and a, a, a black low SES guy, they're gonna have equivalent levels of risk, right? You give me a, a low SES white guy and a high SES black guy, the high SES black guy is gonna be much less risky. SES is a huge, huge, huge factor, right? And love that finding, because I can actually, as a society, we can intervene on that, right? Thank you. Uh, I think you sort of answered my question, but uh, Miguel Marshall, Health and Behavior Studies, and I'm uh, a doctor candidate in Health and Education and Behavior. Um, but uh, I guess uh, to tag on to his question, would you contribute, I know you said SES, and so would you say that some sub part of that would be behavior, emotion, uh, mental, uh, mental health, emotional health, uh, is partly contributing to the differences between the indices of HIV? In the, in the study. Yeah, so when I say SES, and let me say that in our studies, we actually have found that using perceived SES is just as powerful as actual SES, because I don't really know what actual SES is, but I know what perceived SES is. I'm just on that to begin with. Yeah, I think, I think that SES is a structural factor, and that structural factors predispose health states such as mental health and access to services. So yes, I think that there's probably a causal pathway there that goes from these fundamental causes of having a certain race and having a certain SES and living in a certain neighborhood that leads to certain social cohesion factors, which leads to certain behaviors, which leads to outcomes. Yeah, absolutely I do. I don't think it's just simply SES goes to HIV. It's, yeah, this is domino effect, right? And culture, the role of culture. <laughs> The role of culture, and I, you know, there's a lot of discussion about, you know, and this is always, a, I always find this fascinating, this, the, the down low thing, the down low thing. Well, you know, and, and it's not just black men, right? Because like, if you're like an immigrant, you know, white, Russian, Greek, whatever you are, you're on the down low too. Like, I was on the down low until I came up the block here, right? You know, when I was living with my Greek family in Astoria, because I had to be on the down low with them. So the role of culture and how powerful that was in shaping my own behavior, and I see for other young immigrant youth, is, is a critical factor. Uh, Um, and I was kind of wondering when you're when you were looking at the older um, cohort, mm -hmm. um, for the men that are that are having unprotected anal sex, mm -hmm. were those casual or long term? Yeah. Years? So everybody's having unsafe sex in relationships. Let's just, just, just own that. Yeah. Right. <laughs> okay. That's just the way it goes. Um, <laughs> not everyone, but mostly. I mean, you know, you know what I'm saying, right? I love you. Okay, get rid of the condom. Um, <laughs> <laughs> because why wouldn't they? We wouldn't ask a straight couple to use a condom for the rest of their lives when they got married. It's a ridiculous this concept. Okay, so there's a lot of risk happening in the context of main partnerships, right? And a lot of the guys in the study actually, and that's a, this is a great question and analysis I should do, separate the main from the casual. Um, a lot of guys, and I have multiple answers, a lot of guys in the studies are choosing to have main partners who are also HIV positive because it's just easier that way. Um, Not necessarily safe, but they're different strains, but... Um, I don't know about, I don't, I don't want to get into the co-infection, the, yeah. the, the multiple <laughs> infections. I'm disclosure. not sure I believe that. Huh? This is more of the initial disclosure. It's disclosure, right. It's, such, it's just easier. Um, but, what was the question? Oh yeah, so that, but they are having unsafe sex with casual partners too. Yeah, usually with casual, at higher rates of casual partners who are also positive, mm -hmm. right? Because positive men tend to look for other positive men if they want a certain kind of sex. It is easier to negotiate that than with an HIV negative man. Although, should I say my controversial mm -hmm. statement? Yes. Yeah. I'm gonna say it. Because I really believe this. So if, um, <laughs> if I were a young, I'm not that old, but when I was younger, as a young HIV negative 18 year old guy navigating this bar scene, which there isn't anymore, but let's make believe there is, I'm sort of dating myself. I'm navigating the Adam for Adam scene um, or whatever. And I was given a choice 
and the choice was negative guy. I'm negative. I had a test six months ago. And positive guy, hey, I'm positive, but I'm on my meds, and, and my load seems to be pretty under control. This seems, guy seems like a safer choice to me, right? Because his health is being taken care of, his virus is being suppressed. This guy thinks he's negative, right? And what we, we're seeing, and, and this is going to come on for Azana's work, is that the infections that are happening with the negative guys are with, because they're having sex with these mythologically negative guys. These guys were like, oh, that is an HIV test a month ago. Now, let me tell you the other fascinating thing about this particular study. The guys in the study have no idea what an antibody test means. So, if we say that, and we're, we're trying to get money from Idelson, which I think is going to give us money to do this, this um, smartphone app. But I'm not going to tell you more about that, so you can steal the idea. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but we're going to get it. You tell a guy, hey, you know what? You're HIV negative. What does that mean to you? He's going to, 9 out of 10 in the study say, I'm good. They have no idea that if they had sex last night with a, with a and, our, and the guy had high fire load, that the test wouldn't show up positive today. None. That is nowhere on the majority of their radar. So this is why I get back to my controversial point, which is that I know this guy's taking care of himself. I'm not so sure about this guy. Was that the answer to your question? <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. So they're having sex with casual partners, mostly positive casual partners. I was partners. just wondering if you did. Whoa, ADD boy, get in check here. <laughs> so we got a couple more questions. I saw this hand, this one, and one over there. Okay, let's go in. The fourth one. So jumping off that question. Um, Who are you? My name is Emily. I'm in the um, uh, MS on education program. Excellent. So I'm sort of curious, and I don't know if you looked at this, but if you noticed a difference in attitudes toward common use in the older generation versus the younger generation, just based on sort of life experience. Yeah. I'm not a big fan of like the theory of planned behavior and reasoned action mm -hmm. stuff because I don't really think people act that way. Um, no, we haven't. I don't even. I, Do we even measure that? No, no it's the question that usually, if you're having sex, is it unprotected or protected? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And, and let's just be clear. And let's just be clear. All the guys who are having sex in our studies are having, definitely not having condom use for, for oral. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. That's a decision that's been made. And, that's it. Um, for anal, it depends. it depends. But attitudes towards condoms. Mm. Well, it's just, yeah, because like with the baby boomer generation sort of growing up with this highly visible, you know, dealing with death around them from the virus, and then the, you know, this younger generation who's, it's still visible, but it's not quite as... Condom X is an emotional barrier as much as it is mm -hmm. a physical barrier to intimacy. Mm -hmm. Road Health in 1999. So, um, <laughs> so I think that the condom attitudes folks, people could say they like them, but I don't. They're using them. We know, we know folks are using them, but I, I don't think they're being used consistently. Yes. So we can take this question? Yes. Oh, oh. Okay. my name is Eric Santa Cruz, and I'm in the EDD program here Excellent. in health education. And um, I was just wondering if there was actually any research done in your controversial statement, just because um, this is something... The Swiss cohorts, the Swiss statement. Oh. The Swiss, oh, what is he? He's like, what is this crazy man saying? The Swiss statement. Um, the Swiss, uh, 2009, the Swiss statement. This was a very controversial, right? Because, you know, it's the Swiss, you know. <laughs> Roger Federer. Um, the Swiss statement came out in 2009, and basically what it says is, Essentially, if you're an HIV positive person and you're in a relationship with somebody who's HIV negative and you are consistently taking your medication and your viral load is negligible, that it's near impossible for you to transmit HIV. How do you think that, what can we do for the health community to start looking more into this, this type of these type of statements? Because I actually presented something similar to this in the American I think we are doing this. I think we are doing this. I think in the last year, the whole thing, the whole, the whole HIV prevention world and treatment world has been focused on what's referred to as the cascade. Does that mean anything to you? It's not what you put in your dishwasher. Um, <laughs> you, so you can put it in your dishwasher. So the cascade is fascinating, right? So look it up, HIV cascade. Um, of 100 people, let's say for every 100 people in this country, 80 know they're positive. 
60 something are on ed medications of those 80, and only 28 reach viral suppression, right? So we've got a problem, right? We have people who don't know, people who are not on meds, and people who are on meds who are not taking their meds, okay? So there's a real push to try to figure out how we get people to test and treat and adhere to their medications. Because if they do, then the Swiss statement has a lot of bearing. But in the absence of getting people to suppress viral load, you should be using a condom. Okay, so I think we have time for just for these last two questions. I, oh, I can't I remember the hands, but I know two loudly here. Uh, just you and you. Uh, Eric Arnold uh, from the School of Social Work. Just wondering uh, what are the implications of home testing? Oh, God. <laughs> home testing. Well, if our experience, let me first say this. The oral test, not good. Very, it's, the, the, it's not always clear what the result is. The blood prick is much better, right? So we've had situations in our lab where we're like, we're not clear if there's a line there. It's very, it's so, to begin with, the mechanics of the oral test is fraught with issue. Two, um, from our experience, what we see is that these guys need a lot of support when they find out that they're positive. Like, we literally take them from our lab to Dimitri, who's our physician at the medical school, buy them lunch, sit with them there, and this is a traumatic experience in their life. So what do I think about somebody finding out at home they're HIV positive, doing a test on their own with a faulty test? It doesn't know what it looks like. Bad. 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 We should make it easier to test for HIV instead of making it a home test. And one last question. One more question. Hi, my name is Michael. I'm a uh, student in the Film for Knowledge National Program. Um, I'm wondering if any of the research has looked at self disclosure, especially within the context of um, family support systems and how it relates to behaviors and substance abuse. Right, higher levels of social support always related to less, less risk behaviors. Um, and in fact, one of those, I was, I was writing about that this afternoon in the book. I'm on the chapter of the book that's dealing with strategies for survival, and I'm talking about it from a physical, from what they did physically and what they did emotionally and what they did socially. And so many of, I mean, you know, ACTA was important not only because it fought for the right for, for, for people to have medications, but because people had a way to socialize and engage with each other and support each other. So what we tend to see is that when there are those social support systems there, either with other positive people or with family members or with partners, that's why I love positive people being with positive people, it creates less risk behavior. That's pretty consistent with what we're showing now. Yeah. So I think we've really concluded our time. Oh, let's, man. let's thank Professor Peter.